and uh, happy to, uh, to be here. I wanted to talk uh, about uh, just a little uh, part of my life growing up in Ohio. I, as I've told you before, I, I grew up uh, in the area uh, in between Cincinnati, Dayton, and Columbus in a rural farm area. I did not say rural this morning. I, it was whoa, whoa. I it said it three or four times, but I got it this time, and I was so excited that I had to share with you that I said rural. Uh, appropriately. Anyway, but we uh, grew up in that area uh, as a kid all the way until I left uh, for college at the age of 18. We lived uh, about a mile and a half outside of Sabina. Sabina was uh, population 3,500 uh, in, in a little burg or a little ville uh, called Reeseville, and about 80 to 100 people lived there, and there was a post office, but no stop sign. You just kind of drove through it, but we lived on Highway 72, and if you wanted to go to Sabina, you would go up, drive up about 100 yards to the to stop sign there, a caution light, and then drive down what they called the 3C Highway, 22, uh, 3, and what was later uh, 62, to, to connect Cincinnati, uh, Columbus, and Cleveland, but that road went into Sabina. It was, we were way outside of town, we were a mile and a half, and that was a, a long ways uh, for us back then. Uh, I remember uh, riding my bike with my mother uh, and, and all of us would ride the back roads uh, to the swimming pool uh, on the other side of Sabina uh, in the summertime. And uh, the, the neatest thing for me was, was getting into the eighth grade or getting ready to go into my eighth grade year and getting to K uh, Kmart and getting the Kmart All Pro Sky Blue 10 speed bicycle uh, that was lean and mean and could really uh, get down the road. And my dad uh, allowed me to go to the swimming pool by myself. Uh, he would not let me go down the 3C highway because it was a road of death uh, if you were to ride your bicycle down it. So I always had to take the back road. And the back road was, uh, was Black Road and Polk Road into the backside of uh, Sabina and then on out uh, to the pool. So it was about a five mile cycle. Uh, but again, uh, it, was, it was really neat to be able to take off from my house and just uh, go all by myself to the pool. Every time that I rode to the swimming pool and back, and later I rode my bike to, to mow yards, uh, there was one lady that lived way on the other side of Sabina that had a mower, and all I had to do was just ride there uh, to, to uh, mow her yard. But uh, one of the things, or, or the main thing that factored in uh, with my ride every time I got on that bike and went to Sabina was one thing. What is the wind doing? What is the wind doing? The wind usually came out of the west, and Black Road ran from kind of southwest to northeast. So usually when I came off of 72 and got on Black Road, usually I would feel the wind as I made that turn all of a sudden just shoot me forward. And, and I was, man, you know, I'm just get, getting on it here. I'm getting, getting going. And, and you just, you get to where you, I wouldn't even think about it. And I developed the skill. This wasn't right in my eighth grade year, but a little bit later. I developed a skill with 10 speeds. I realized I don't have to use my hands. I, if I lean back on the seat and just pedal, I could sometimes go down all of Black Road and it had a couple of hairpin turns without putting my hands on, uh, the, uh, on the handlebars. But... The thing was, as always, as I came back, and almost always, the wind came out of the west. I mean, sometimes the southwest, sometimes the northwest, but it was almost always with me on the way in. But when I came home, it was like I forgot about it, and then all of a sudden, boom, I make that turn on Black Road, and then the wind is just gusting at my face. It's just pushing me back. And we, we also ran on that road. We knew the exact mile markers of the, the half mile mark, the mile, the mile and a half, the, the two, the three, depending on what we ran as we uh, trained as a family uh, running as kids. But we knew each of those markers, so I knew painstakingly where each spot was and how much farther I had to go as I pedaled often into a 20 mile per hour headwind. And I hated that. Uh, I hated it when I was running to where I'd have to lean into that and I just could not look ahead because if I looked way ahead I saw I've got a long way to go. I had to look down, lean forward, and if I biked it was even worse. Uh, for some reason, I don't know how it was for you, that, that you guys that like to ride bikes, but I, I would rather run into the wind than bike into the wind. But I felt it with every single pedal. What headwinds have you faced in the last two years? 
the, the headwinds that have been 20 to 30 miles per hour right in your face. What headwinds, or are there any headwinds that you've faced all of your life? I would imagine that there are, there are quite a few in here that could say, I, I've had some headwinds that have lasted all my life, and they're still headwinds that I'm pushing into as I'm being pushed back. Why do people think that life is so hard for them? Well, one of the answers is because it is. <laughs> it is. Life, life is hard. To live is to suffer, said uh, Nietzsche, uh, the philosopher. Uh, everything they face represents an uphill climb, a battle. Uh, I can't catch a break. I can't catch a break in the action. Uh, I, I, I tend to get resentful of what I'm put upon. Life is harder than it should be. I know life is supposed to be hard, but why is it harder for me than it should be? Uh, things are handed to others that I know on a silver platter. As I look at their lives, I see what they've been given, and I don't, I don't have that, yet they have that, and, and that's not my history of my life. Nothing comes easy in my life, and here's proof because of this, 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 and this that I faced. See? This is, this is what I'm dealing with. I am living the life of, of, of riding into a headwind. My parents were tougher on me than they were on my siblings. I, I got less freedoms, fewer freedoms, than my own siblings did. Whatever, whatever the situation is, some of those we might say fits us, that we say, I, I've said that before, or I've thought that before. Who likes here, who likes being unhappy? Anybody? I, I, would, I would say this, most of us would say that we don't like to be unhappy, but I, I think I've known some people that do revel in being unhappy. There aren't many, but I, I think I've met a few in my life that, that do revel in, in, in their misery. Some like the attention that they get from others when they're in uh, their dreadful state and they talk about it and they get that sympathy. Some equate unhappiness with depth. You know, I, I, you know, as I reflect on life and this and that, a, a true deep thinker, uh, when he sees that or she experienced that, it is unhappy because of the depth of, of understanding that that person has of, of, of his or her situations in life. I recently listened to a, a radio uh, broadcast on uh, NPR, listened to different ones at different times. This one was one uh, two or three weeks ago I was... Uh, riding in the car on a, on a Sunday afternoon, and it was called, uh, it was a, a, a topic that was on this radio show, Freakonomics Radio. Anybody heard of that, uh, Freakonomics Radio? So some of you have heard that. It's an interesting uh, 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 series that goes on NPR occasionally, but uh, it was a rebroadcast of an episode that, that aired first on March 15th, 2017, if you'd like to look it up. But uh, the, the title of, the, of that uh, program hour uh, was called uh, Headwinds and Tailwinds. Headwinds and Tailwinds. And they interviewed a couple of fellows that are uh, research uh, professors at, I can't remember which university, but the, the, the names were Shai David I and Tom Gilovich, uh, authors of this book, which I did not read, but the podcast to which I listened uh, went through it in quite uh, intricate detail, and also I, I looked at the article later, but the book was called this, if you'd ever like to, to read it. It's the Headwinds, Tailwinds, Asymmetry book. You know, symmetry, this is the same as this. Uh, you know, 50% of our lives are basically headwinds. 50% of our lives are tailwinds when we're being pushed along. You know, I, you know most would say, well, it's probably about 50-50. Uh, but, but he talks about, uh, they talk about the asymmetry uh, asymmetrical nature of how we view headwinds and tailwinds in life. I want to talk about that today because there are many, many spiritual implications for us that, that I, I dare say uh, affects our lives in how we view the degree to which we have headwinds and tailwinds and the impact that it has on our lives. It affects our spiritual walk. Where would you say your situation is with your headwinds and tailwinds that you've faced in the last couple of years, in the last year. More tailwinds, more headwinds. Or is it about 50-50, like it is on a bike? When you turn around, it was with you, and you turn around and head back home, and it's right in your face. Uh, 
Which, which is it? I think most of us in the church would agree that we, we tend, not, uh, tend to not be as grateful as we should be. We strive to do that. And, and you know, we ask, why is that? Uh, and, and we strive to be more grateful. But let's, let's begin by going to a passage which we covered two weeks ago in uh, the sermon on, uh, on, on the Sabbath and ceasing on the Sabbath. Let's go to Isaiah 58. Isaiah 58, we'll read uh, this again as, as God talks about if we turn our feet away from doing our own pleasure on the Sabbath and, and we turn towards God, call the Sabbath a delight, not doing our own pleasures, but, but worshiping God and honoring God and calling that day honorable. He says he'll do something for us. He says he'll do something for us. So let's, let's read that again. It's mentioned here in verse 14, Isaiah 58. He says, if you do this... Uh, not speaking our own words, and we talked about all that two weeks ago. He says, then you shall delight yourself in the Lord. You're going to delight yourself in the Lord. And here's what God says will happen. And I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth, and I'll feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father. The mouth of the eternal has spoken this. He says, this is what will happen. So, so I would ask us, uh, as we look at that, that's, would, would we not say that's a pretty serious tailwind, isn't it? That's a, that's a pretty serious situation where God says, I'm going to be this wind behind you that's going to boost you along, that's going to boost us along on our Kmart All Pro 10 speed over the high hills uh, of, of, of Israel and, and being fed with the, the, the heritage of Jacob. Notice what it says in Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59, verse 1. Because as we read on, we see something else. After reading uh, these verses, there are two things that we should consider. Let's read uh, the rest of this. Be but he says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened. It's not shortened that it cannot save. It's not shortened that his, e or his ears uh, aren't heavy so that it cannot hear. Uh, but your iniquities have separated you from God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Your hands are defiled with blood, your fingers with iniquity, your lips have spoken lies, your tongue mutters of uh, perversity. No one calls for justice, doesn't plead for the truth. People trust in empty words and speak lies and conceive evil and bring forth iniquity. All these kinds of things. So after reading that, after, after we read on that and reflect upon it, there are two things that we need to think about. If we see our lives as one gigantor headwind coming straight at us, instead of a combination of both. Two things. One is, what's going on in my life? Is, is there, are there things that I'm doing that fit into what Isaiah 59 is saying? Because those, those things will begin to face us. Uh, those things will face us head on, uh, and, and our iniquities will separate us from being able to ride on the hills uh, as God intends for us in this life and in the life to come. I, I submit to you that Isaiah 58, 14 is about this life, and it is about the life to come. And I'm not talking about a health, wealth, gospel. I, I, I'm talking about God says he'll look after us, uh, and he will cause us to have tailwinds in our lives uh, as we follow God. So, so one thing we think about, okay, so am I doing something? Am I doing things that are separating me from God, that, that are separating the situation from being blessed? What do I need to do about it? I need to do something about it, if that's the case. But secondly, if we see our life as full headwinds or 80-20 or 90-10 or headwinds, uh, could it also be this? I am simply not recognizing the tailwinds in my life. I'm not recognizing uh, what is going on in my life, and it's, it's a matter of my having an inaccurate perception of what's going on in my life and how God is blessing me. Uh, that sometimes is, is something with which we struggle as well. I want to talk about that today because it's critical for us to be able to move forward spiritually and grow uh, that, that, that ability to do that is tied directly to the recognition of headwinds and tailwinds. When, 
and there are a couple of dynamics with that, and this isn't rocket science for us, I, I, we, we know this, but when I'm facing a headwind, when we're facing a headwind, every single rotation, uh, uh, revolution of that bicycle, uh, of, of the pedals, every single step that we take uh, is, is in our faces, and, and we feel that. But just like when I came off of 72 and went on to Black Road and felt the wind behind my back, I felt that tailwind. I felt that tailwind all of a sudden pushing me, and I thought, this is really nice. But do you know what happens? It, it's what happens in our lives. About a minute later, I've forgotten about it. It's like, well, well it's, it's not a challenge. It, it's there. So I'm, I'm, on, I'm on to other things. I'm on to get, getting to the swimming pool uh, and, and uh, heading down the road or seeing how far I can ride without, without uh, holding on to the handlebars. I, I'm, I'm thinking of other things. That is the nature of the headwinds and, and tailwinds. We, we quickly forget that it's at our back, we're looking to the next hurdle, and yet we're continuing to benefit from the huge tailwind in our lives. See what I'm saying? Uh, for example, uh, on, on, this, on this podcast, they were, they were talking, it was interesting, uh, they, were, they were talking about a comedian that, that told the story. He said, yeah, it was like, he said, you remember when, that, the guy said, you remember when uh, it came out that all of a sudden we were going to be able to access the internet on, on, on airplanes? And it was, this is incredible. You know, we can, we can now, all of us with our laptops can just uh, jump on the internet. So uh, he said, I remember, he said, this guy, this guy said, I was on this flight, and I was by this guy who was sit sitting uh, just across from me, and they announced that this, that this was happening. And he said, this is, this is great. Uh, and, you know, so you know, getting out their laptops, and, they're, and they're, they're starting in, and they're hooking in YouTube, and they got this video and that video, and, and cruising along. And, uh, you know, who'd have thought that we would ever have had this uh, on airplanes to be able to do that? And then 10 minutes later, the flight attendant gets on uh, and says, oh, I'm sorry, folks, we've had a, a malfunction in this area, in this area, and the Internet will be down uh, uh, until we can get this matter resolved. And the guy beside him is like, oh, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. You know, I paid good money for this flight. And now, now they don't even have the Internet working. What am I supposed to do? And, and the, the, the comedian saying, man, you didn't even know it existed 10 minutes ago, and now you're already ticked. And, you know, and, and, but, but that is something that happens, this, this situation of adaptation. We adapt to an incredible tailwind, and it's, it's, it's to be expected. Psychology calls it the hedonic treadmill, the hedonism the hedonism treadmill. We have to run really hard to get somewhere. We, we finally get somewhere or get something. Then, then, then we, feel, we feel good initially, but then we adapt to it, and then we quickly become dissatisfied with that state, and we push on to the next, the next thing. But, but there's also a, another reason, and, uh, and, and that is uh, something that we've talked about already just briefly. But there's another reason, a legitimate reason. We don't have to focus on the tailwind to keep going. It's pushing us along. We have to focus on the headwinds. If we don't focus fully on the headwinds, the headwinds are going to knock us off. They're going to knock us off or they're going to cause us to come to a complete standstill. And, and that is part of the nature of it too, is to recognize, yeah, that, that, is, that is some of the situation that I must focus on what is pushing against me. That in essence, as, as they would say in this article, is the headwinds, tailwinds, asymmetry. I've, I've got to focus so much on this in order to push against this that I don't recognize that I am being pushed along. So think about the, the repercussions of that spiritually. How would you say your life is characterized in that respect? How much time and how much, how much appreciation and how much how, of how much value do we see or what's our realization of the ways in which we are being boosted along by these tailwinds that God gives us in life. Let's turn, if we would, to 2 Corinthians 10. 2 Corinthians 10. Uh, they mentioned uh, some of these, what they would, would call our enemies of gratitude or, or opposites of gratitude or, or, or things in our lives that that we can allow to rise up as we're facing headwinds in our lives, brutal headwinds in our lives. 2 Corinthians 10, and we'll, we'll read that here in just a second. I wanted to turn there 
So I'll be ready to go when we come to that point. Uh, but one of the first enemies of gratitude is one that we talked about. It's called habituation or adaptation. We, we, we are thankful for it. We adapt. It, it becomes habit, and then we forget about it. We, but, it, but it's still there. It's still pushing us along. And when it happens, oh, that's great. But then, and we think, man, this was an incredible intervention here that turned things around and all of a sudden is pushing me forward. But then we start sweating the small stuff again because there are other things that come up and we forget about that. Habituation and adaptation, just like the fellow on the airplane. The, this one was not one that they talked about uh, in, in the book or in the, in the podcast, but it, it's something that I've seen that I have to fight in my own life. I've seen this with God's people, and we've talked about this to some degree before, but I think it's very pertinent as we talk about it today. I'd call it the, the future high syndrome, the future high, H-I-G-H syndrome. I will be happy when I can finally get this tailwind going in my life that I'm being pushed in this direction. When I can finally get that on the happiness scale of one to 10, that will be a 10. When I finally get married, then, then all of a sudden, I'll feel the wind shift. I've got somebody with me for life, and here we go. It's tailwind time, baby. I'm gonna make like 30 minutes time on a, on a flight uh, to California. I am, I am really gonna jump ahead of schedule. And when I get this job, that pays this much. When I get this kind of job that is in this environment, when I get in this kind of congregation where it has these kinds of people that look after me and that I can look after them, then I can be here. I can finally get there and I can finally have the tailwind. Uh, that, is, that is an obstacle uh, to understanding the tailwinds that we're already receiving in our lives. Uh, again, getting married, paying job, vacation. Oh, when I can finally get this vacation, then I will be happy. Uh, well, vacations don't always end up being tens on the scale, do they? Uh, uh, sometimes they're, they're fours. Uh, most times they're seven eights, maybe, maybe, maybe sometimes some tens. But the future high syndrome always puts us in a situation to where we, we don't recognize the tailwinds that are pushing us along. The, you know, the, the con contrast to that is, I have found in whatsoever state I am there with to be content, uh, as, as, as Paul says. A third area, a simple uh, but very powerful enemy of, of gratitude is greed. This is not enough. If having is the end all, then I need to have this, and it makes it hard to take stock of what I've been given because I need this, and I need this, and now I need to have this. Uh, greed uh, is, is also a component sometimes that leads to what we want to talk about here in 2 Corinthians 10. These are things that impact us. These are things that can get into the minds of God's people, that have gotten into the minds of God's people, and things that we must kick out, uh, an enemy of, of recognizing the tailwinds that are in our lives, and that is envy. Envy. Let's see it here in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 12. He says, for we dare not class ourselves. Paul is saying here, we, we, we're not to class ourselves or we're, going, we're not going to compare ourselves with those who commend themselves. But he said they, what they do, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, that kind of thing is not wise. He says, we, however, though, will not boast beyond measure, but we'll boast within the, within the limits of the sphere which God appointed us, a sphere which especially includes you. No, I'm not going to be in a situation where I compare this and that, and you've got this, and I've got this, and I want this, and you don't have this envy, uh, greed to have this. No, Paul says, we, we look at it as, as the blessings that, that God has given us, and, and the, those blessings and, and the degree to which we boast includes you, because we are, we are all part of one another. We are all pot, part of this body uh, uh, of Jesus Christ, uh, and, and that extends out to you in a way that is not comparing, but in a way of, of love and building up. He says, for we're not overextending ourselves as though our authority did not extend to you, for it was to you that we came with the gospel of Christ. And in doing so, not boasting of things beyond measure, verse 15, that is, in other man's labors, but, but having hope that as your faith is increased, then we shall greatly be enlarged by you in our sphere. We'll, we'll be enlarged to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you even, and not to boast in another man's sphere of accomplishment. But he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. 
That, that's where our, our focus is. That's where Paul said his focus is. He says, for, for not he who commends himself is approved, but it's whom the Lord commends. And then he goes on to say, uh, I, verse 2, I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband. He looks at the church, he looks at the brethren in Corinth uh, as the, the chaste virgin that he wants to keep for the husband, Jesus Christ. But I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Greed can lead to envy, and envy can lead to the fourth, uh, the fourth area, and, and Satan is in all of this, and that is resentment. Resentment is such a powerfully negative uh, emotion and, and feeling to let come into our lives. Have any of you ever suffered from that? Have any of you ever allowed resentment of, of other people's situations? It moves beyond envy and then moves into an area of resentment. It's very, very dangerous. It's very, very dangerous that must be turned from and repented of immediately because resentment leads to bitterness. Resentment leads to all kinds of of, uh, of bad behavior. And again, it, it, simply le it simply stems from others have it better than I do. Others have the tailwinds. I've got the headwinds. And it leads to resentment. Our society is riddled with resentment. Our society feeds on resentment. Just, just think about this past week. Was there a little bit of resentment in the news this week? A little bit of resentment from the different groups that are out there? Uh, everything is biased towards the Democrats. Everything. You look at it, everything is biased towards them. We conservatives are, are stopped here and here and here and here. It's all biased towards the Democrats. Everything is biased towards the Republicans. Everything. They get this break here, this break here, this break here. It's, it's, it's uh, serve the rich, serve the rich, give them tax breaks. The poor continue to suffer. Cutting these programs, this program, this program. Everything is biased towards the Republicans. This nation right now is having an attack on the white male. You ever heard that one? It's, it's all an attack against the white male, the white Christian male. You see it at an early age in school. Don't you? You know, you, you, it, a bunch of women, they're all women teachers. I, I am acting here. I want you to realize that. <laughs> but a bunch of women teachers, they're, they're raising our boys. All this gender equity stuff that they're teaching, our boys are, are, are getting nothing but sensitivity training, and they're, they're raising our boys into being these mamby-pamby little wimpy boys that don't know how to stand up and be men, and it's ultimately attack and attack against the white Christian male. Because the white Christian male uh, is, has, has done this and this and this and this, and we've got all of these things that are against it, so it's, it's all an attack for that. No, it's actually a white man's world, and that's not the way it should be. The white has all the advantage. This world is biased against women. Check the, check the salary schedules. It's still that way. There's still a, a huge salary discrepancy for women as compared to men. Women that do the same jobs, you look at it, look at it, take, get the statistics, look at it, it's there. Uh, women don't make what men make, and, they, and many of them do the same job, and they don't get that. No, it's a white man's world, biased against Hispanics, blacks, Asians. They, they, they were pushed down before. Yes, things have gotten a little bit better, but we're still dealing with slavery all around us. And we've got this person in office now and this person in office now. The only reason these people want to be in office because they'll get all these people in the country and, uh, illegally and then they'll vote for them so they can stay in power. The only reason... This, this guy wants to get all these people out is because he says this, this, and this, but he just wants to keep his power base. It's, it's resentment, isn't it? It's resentment is everywhere. Our nation is seething with, with resentment. It's what drives society. It's what drives Satan, the devil. Do we allow ourselves to get sucked into these controversies? 
in our congregation here in Dallas, in our congregation in Sherman, we have Hispanics, we have blacks, we have Asians, we have whites, we have men, we have women, we have people who make very little money. We have people in our congregation who make a ton of money. We, we have all of those things right here in Dallas. We often have differing thoughts about what direction our government needs to go for this country to turn around, don't we? Some get very vocal about those things, as if that is going to change things. Do we allow ourselves, as God's people, as brothers, to get sucked into these controversies that I submit to you that at the heart of it, that, that when I say at the heart, but at, at part of the heart of it is Satan the devil, resentment. Scripture speaks very differently about this than what we see going on in our country right now. Let's look at uh, four, four passages very quickly here. 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 12. You know, you think of the, the white supremacist Nazi group at Charlottesville, uh, Charlottesville, Virginia this week. Do you think they have, have just a little bit of resentment in, the, in their, in their uh, philosophies? What about the folks that, uh, that, were, that, that came in and, and then you know, we had this big ruckus uh, that happened. People were killed, violence uh, that ensued. And now the big discussion is, is uh, well, you know, President Trump said this. He should have. He should have outwardly said that that you know the, the whole situation with the supremacist Nazis was was bad and everything. But but he should have said that was awful, and he should not have even addressed these folks over here that did something that was inappropriate as well. Uh, he shouldn't do that because on a scale of right and wrongness, this is so wrong that this, in, in comparison to that, is, is way up here, so you shouldn't even bring that up. Big mistake for him to bring that up. You know, and it's, it's just resentment. It's just resentment everywhere on all kinds of levels. And, and our nation and, and the world and Satan feeds off of it. They, they feed off of that. It's all hail, it's all hail winds, uh, hail winds, headwinds, uh, headwinds for us. It's all, that's what we experience. It's tailwinds for them. And what it happens, it encourages this resentful, unappreciative, as psychology folks would say, it creates an unhealthy emotional, psych emotional psychological state where we're not at our best selves. Uh, that's what they said in the, in the uh, podcast. Uh, we in the church would say it creates a situation where we sin, <laughs> where we sin. Uh, and, and we do not think of things uh, in, in a godly manner and view situations as God views them. 1 Corinthians 12, uh, no, in contrast, here's what Paul says. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12, For as the body is one and as many members, but all the members of that one body being many are, are one body, so, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were baptized into one body. Do we believe that? Yes, we believe that. It doesn't matter whether we're Jews. It doesn't matter whether we're Greeks. It even doesn't matter whether we're slaves or free. We have all been made to drink into one spirit. Do we believe that? Because, brethren, we are going to be, as a church, tested in this area. We are going to be tested uh, as this nation continues to spiral. Uh, you and I are tested in this. Part of the whole purpose of, of, of Paul's writing of first and, and, and second Corinthians were to you know part of that purpose was to help the brethren understand that this is the battle this is where we can go if we allow ourselves to be deceived by the great deceiver the, the great resenter uh, himself Satan the devil uh, look at verse 22 verse 22 no no much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker or necessary and those members of the body which we think to be less honorable on these we bestow greater honor and our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. Verse 24, but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it. So he talks, he's talking about all of it working together. And some would say, well, this is more important than this. But he says, no, no, it all works together. For what reason? Verse 25, we know this, that there should be no schism, no division, no division in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. 
because we don't view ourselves as rich or poor or white or Asian or black or, or handicapped in this way or handicapped in this way or wealthy or, or whatever. We, we don't do that. We see ourselves as part of the same body and we, as a result, have the same care for one another. So if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, we're happy for that person. If that person is, uh, happens to get a great job, even though I've been struggling here, I am happy for this person. If this person happens to have a, a, a person come into his or her life and is married, I am happy for that person. Yes, I've been single for 79 hundred years and I really want to get married, but I am happy for this person uh, because uh, that person uh, is, is, is honored and that person receives that, that incredible joy. So I will be happy because that person is part of me, because that person is part of my body as I am part of the body of Christ. So therefore, we are all happy. Uh, you are the body of Christ, verse 27, and members individually. Ephesians 6, parallel passage. Let's go there. Ephesians 6, verse 5. We'll read verses 5 through 9. Ephesians 6, verse 5. He says, bond servants. He's saying slaves here. Slaves. In that situation, they had slaves and masters uh, during that time in, in, uh, in uh, the Roman uh, Roman provinces. He says, uh, bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh. Do so with fear and trembling, with, with reverence, and do it in sincerity of heart as to Christ. Verse 6, Ephesians 6. Not doing it with eye servant as men pleasers. Any of you see, uh, I won't make you raise your hands, but uh, those of you that have watched Downton Abbey occasionally, you know, I've, I've, we finally finished that series, but it's, it's fascinating watching the whole dynamics between uh, the, the ruling class and then the servants there at the abbey. And, and the things that, uh, you know, the servants come up and they know they must behave in this way and say this and say this and say this, but when they come down, you know, come down where the servants are, they've got, they've got some stories to tell. Uh, serve with eye service. And again, I, you know, there were those on, uh, in that show that did not just serve with eye service. They, they served heartily. But, but that's an example of, of folks that, that serve with, with eye service that, that we can do in our jobs and as we interact with one another. Uh, but not with eye service as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service, as if they're doing it to, to Jesus Christ and not to men knowing that whatever good anyone does, he'll receive the same from the Lord, whether he's a slave or free. And you masters, those of you that have responsibility of the other, uh, over others, do the same things to them. Don't, you know, he, he says, give up threatening, knowing that your own master uh, is also in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. Colossians 3, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Colossians 3, verse 8. Colossians 3, verse 8 he says that we're to put off these things that uh, Isaiah 59 was talking about. Uh, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language, in iniquity, all of those kinds of things, uh, those iniquities that 59 of Isaiah talked about. Don't lie to one another since we put off the old man with his deeds. And we put on the new man who's renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. And here he says again, as we view ourselves, as God views us, he's, you know, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, it's not you know, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian or Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. That, that, that's how we are to view one another. That's how uh, that keeps us from moving into a state of resentfulness. Verse 12, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, instead, no, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another, because we mess up. I mess up, you mess up. We mess up. And it is, it is, it is so wonderful to be in a situation where when we do mess up and we acknowledge that, we can forgive one another and we can be restored uh, as brothers and, and friends in the church. It's going to happen. Mistakes are going to happen. Sin is going to occur. Uh, how, how gentle are we with others as, as we work through those? But above all, he says, verse 14, put on love. This is what bonds us together. This is the bond of perfection. 
and the peace of God will uh, let it rule in your hearts to which you were also called in one body. And there it is. See the tailwind. Be thankful. Be thankful. One other passage that speaks to this. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5. We'll start in verse 14. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14. How do we view the headwinds in our lives? Do we cause it to allow us to envy? Do, do, we, cause it, uh, do we allow it to cause resentment? How does it impact our relationship with others in the church who, on the, on the surface, we, we may think they uh, are having everything handed to them on a silver platter? As we've talked before, most times as we get to know one another, we see everybody is dealing with quite a few headwinds in his or her life. Uh, but but uh, lest we get to that state of, of, of judging uh, wrongly, uh, we see another example of how Paul views God's people and how we should view one another. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14, For the love of Christ compels us, it, it constrains us, uh, be, because we, we judge thus, that if one died for all, Christ died for you, uh, he died for me. Uh, if one died for all, then all of us died. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, not a matter of, of self-interest and, and, and envy and, and all these kinds of things. But, but no, we, we live for him who died for them and rose again. Verse 16, therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. That's not what we focus on in God's church. That's not we, what we focus on as brothers and sisters. Even though we've known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we, we know him thus no longer. Because if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passing away and, and all things are becoming new. There's a freshness, there's a progressiveness uh, in, in the right direction in our lives. All things are of God who has reconciled us to himself. God has put us in a situation where we are brought back into his favor. We are restored to favor uh, by, uh, to God by the satisfaction of, of the of the claims of justice against us. We're brought to that point uh, through, through Jesus Christ, and he's given us the ministry of reconciliation. Uh, so as a result, we're, we're ambassadors of Christ, and knowing that he who may, uh, had, had no sin became sin for us, that the righteousness of God might be in him. So we are part of that as, as God's people. But no way, I, I feel that I face way more headwinds than others. Does that creep into your life? The misperception uh, that, that others have it better than I, this unfair advantage, uh, typically leads to two very tempting behaviors uh, into which we can fall. One is, because we see that, we, we tend to do fewer things for that person that we perceive has it all. Uh, and be, again, part, part of that is because resentment comes in. And like we said before, as we get to know a person, we typically find out that that's not the case. They've, they've gone through quite a bit themselves. But the second tempting behavior that can happen when we, when we get into that situation of, of they have more tailwinds than I uh, is, is something that we see sometimes happen in sports. It's this, we can tend to do questionable things uh, that we would not otherwise do because we perceive that we need to even the slate. So in order to even the slate, I am okay with, eh, you know, working a little bit of an angle to get it right. So l let me give an example. Those of you that play tennis, I am lousy at tennis, and those of you that have played tennis with me can attest to that. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk about pickleball because that is similar to tennis even though it's a little plastic ball that we hit over a net. But uh, in, in, in tennis, in most tennis matches, as well in pickleball, you call your own lines. You know what I mean by that? Uh, if I'm hitting uh, across the net to Scott and Timothy Rickard, who are back at the back, and Scott was paying attention, he's still paying attention, and Timothy is now looking a little bit more intently at me. But if I'm hitting into their court, 
And with the powerful force that I have, which all of you know, uh, I hit the ball so hard that I drive it past them before they even see it. Whoa! And it went back, and they look, and they, uh, they think, well, man, that was kind of close, but I never really saw it. Out! I'm going to call out. That, that ticks me off because I hammered that ball and I saw it with my razor sharp eyes uh, uh, as well as all of my musculature as I drove that ball down, that that ball landed a foot in. I know that I have no recourse in, in pickleball uh, to say you're wrong uh, because it's his call. That's, that's the rules. It's his call. It's their, their court uh, to say that it was out. But what do I do the next time they hit a ball that's anywhere close to the line on my side? Out! Uh, that, that, that's, that's, that's the way people leave in the score. Well, is that ethical? But, but, yet, but yet that's what happens. We see that in basketball. You play pickup games. You ever play pickup games in basketball where uh, you call your own fouls and you get a team that's just hammering you and they don't call their fouls. You think, well, I won't call it. I won't call it. But then, you know, they drive and you go up. You, get, you barely nick a piece of the ball and you knock it out, but you did not touch the foul. Oh, well, call your own fouls. Okay, so foul. But next time that guy comes and steals the ball from me and does not touch me, I'm going to call foul. Uh, it's, it's that kind of thing of, of, of what can happen is I'm going to even the, sto- even the score. It, did I do it ethically? No, it was not ethically. And so we get into that thing of does the ends justify the means? Is process as important as the end result to God? Uh, you know, I, I talk about uh, sports. Sports is a microcosm often of life, but these kinds of things project that out to our lives. Do, are we ever guilty of that, of playing that game? This guy does this? Oh, I'm going to do this. I perceive that he did this for this reason and this reason and this reason. I perceive that she did this for this reason and this reason and this reason, so I'm going to do this. I know it's not ethical, but I'm okay with that because this was wrong. Uh, they created a tailwind and put a headwind in my face that was unjustified. Uh, so I'll make that right. Uh, the, the study did a, this, uh, the, the article, the two fellows did a study with, uh, and this is going to show my ignorance for those of you that are accountants, but they talked about uh, two disciplines of study in academics under the area of accounting. And they said there is what they call experimental accounting, which deals more with uh, auditing and and, and some of these things, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll ask Mr. Jennings for clarification on this uh, later. But, but uh, and, and then there's what's considered non-experimental accounting and, and different degree uh, plans for those. So within that academic discipline, there are these separate disciplines. So they did a study with, uh, with professors that taught in both of these disciplines. And in that, uh, they, they started it by asking, how do you perceive that it is for you to get grants, to get funds, uh, what you have to teach, the research, that, that, the challenges that, that are, are facing students and are facing you for your area, versus the non-experimental accounting folks. And it was, it was interesting that both perceived the other as having all the tailwinds, uh, and it was so much harder for us. But then what they did, so that, you know, that's a reality that tends to happen with people. But then what they did was they went to that next step. They asked them, do you see yourself, if you see yourself more, more challenged or disadvantaged than the other uh, field, <clears throat> do you see that that gives you more flexibility in questionable moral practices like, for instance, accepting funding uh, from, from questionable sources, as long as the research is okay, uh, or saying that uh, I wrote three research papers when it was really just one research paper that I put in three different journals uh, to, to show that I or we are producing in, in, our, in our area. Those kinds of things, questionable research practices, do you see that as, 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 as you having more flexibility because you are facing, in a sense, more headwinds. Both of them answered yes. Uh, both of them answered yes. And that gets to a principle in Christianity. Does it justify the means? Well, of course, we know the answer is no. Is process as important as the end result with God? Yes. I won't turn there, but I'll give you these scriptures. If you'd like to jot them down, I'll quote them uh, from the NIV but uh, you can look at them later. These are uh, principles to keep in mind when we're facing the headwinds. Proverbs 10:12. Nope, 
Proverbs 10.2, I'm sorry. Ill-gotten treasures are of no value, but righteousness delivers from death. Proverbs 10.3, the Lord does not let the righteous grow hungry. He'll look after us. Proverbs 10.9, the man of integrity walks securely, but he who takes crooked paths will be found out. Proverbs 10.12, hatred stirs up dissension. And Proverbs 11.3, I like this one. The integrity of the upright guides them, but the unfaithful are destroyed by their duplicity. What are some ways to keep us from overweighting our headwinds as we move to the latter part of the message? And I, I would submit that many of you do this. I would submit that most in the congregation here really do not struggle with this. It is, is really refreshing and uh, inspiring to talk with God's people who, who see the tailwinds that, that God is providing that boosts them along towards his kingdom. But uh, one is uh, one that I think you would probably uh, readily say, and this was one actually that came from uh, these, these first two, came from the, the article. Uh, develop a thankful list. Uh, maybe a type of, they called it a, a gratitude diary. Because we recognize the, the, the tailwinds become, because we don't have to think about the tailwinds, once we start going this direction, it's really important to, to, to write down that gratitude diary. Otherwise, I forget the tailwind that I'm riding on right now. That I'm, that I'm riding on the high hills. A second uh, thing, a, a second method that can be very helpful for us to see the, the balance is, is handing a letter to someone, a handwritten letter given face to face to someone that has done something for us in some way that's benefited us. To, to do that and hand that to him. It, it's amazing uh, the impact that that has in, in realizing the tailwinds that we have. You know, this guy did this for me or in, did this for me. Well, I appreciate that. Thanks. I, I told him thanks. I told him thanks. Uh, but to take the time to write a letter to him or her to say thank you, uh, it, it, it burns it more in our minds. This was not in the, uh, let's turn to 2 Corinthians 9. This was not in uh, their list, but it's one that I've seen God's people use over the years, and it works. It works. It is this. Give of your money, give of your time, give of your life, and give of your love to others. One of the most incredible ways to, to experience the tailwinds of being pushed uh, forward by the great God who is our rear guard uh, towards his kingdom. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7, we read this uh, very often, as you'll recognize the language here, in, in offerings uh, at offertory messages. But think about this. You know, of course, they were uh, gathering funds to, to help folks in need uh, at the time. But think about this as a way of life. And, and what, what it's talking about here, the tailwinds that, that God puts in place for us as we think in this manner and act in this manner. Uh, 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7, especially when we feel we're facing headwinds. Uh, 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7, So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or out of necessity, compulsion. I've got to do this. Uh, for God loves a cheerful giver. God's able to make all grace abound towards you, that you having all sufficiency, that's some serious tailwinds here, in all things may have an abundance for every good work. <laughs> I'm serious. That is, that's a 40 mile per hour wind at our back blowing us forward right there. As it is written, he's dispersed abroad, he's given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Talking here of God. May he do that for us. While you're enriched in everything for, for all liberality, which causes thanksgiving through us to God. For the administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints, but, it's, but also is abounding through many thanksgivings to God. While through the proof of this ministry, the, the, as they receive it, they, they glorify God for the obedience of your confession in your giving to the gospel of Christ and for your liberal sharing with them and all men. 
So they glorify God because of that. And what do they do for you? Verse 14, and by their prayer for you, who long for you because of the exceeding grace of God in you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Major tailwind. Major tailwind that God uses to push us forward uh, in our lives as we give of our money, our time, our lives, and our love to others. For what are you thankful? I want to, uh, the last part of the message here, get into this last method that... Uh, speaks to something that uh, I try to do. I, I, this week I did it for about an hour. Uh, remember I told you about my a meditation spot uh, two weeks ago? I got into that meditation spot underneath uh, my desk with my feet up and got the light down, closed my eyes and just thought. Uh, and uh, I could have gone longer, but uh, I'll, I'll call it this, uh, Tailwinds Reflections. Tailwinds Reflections help us see how God really does cause us to ride on the high hills of the earth. You know, a lot of basic things that we don't often think about in this country. You know, what are my tailwinds? What are the things that boost me along? The invisible things that make my life easier. I have opportunities, and I say, I'm, I, I say that as, as we speak of, of us. Think of yours as I say some of the things that came to mind for me. I had opportunity for education. I can read. How much of the world can read? I can read. That's a major tailwind. Uh, I can put together thoughts and plans and make decisions about my life. I am not a slave. I am alive. I'm not dead. It would be really, I really wouldn't be going anywhere if I were dead. Uh, I, I'm alive. I, everything around me in nature is amazing. Child mortality rates have decreased. I have air conditioning in my home. I breathe in, as I go outside, for the most part, fresh air. I get to take in fresh air every day. I have clean drinking water. I have indoor plumbing although there is a bit of a sewage problem out in the front of my house right now that's really starting to stress me out. It's gurgling up and it is not clear water. So that is a headwind that I will face uh, some $2,000 plus or whatever down the road. But I do right now, things are flowing in, in, our, in our plumbing system. I'm very thankful for that. Uh, uh, I have the ability to get from here to there. Roads that are maintained. We have people that regulate the quality of our food. So the things that I eat when I buy them in the grocery store, I don't have to worry for the most part about them killingly, killing me at least immediately. Uh, so we, we have the, I have a dwelling place. I, as I've told you, I have a beautiful tree in my backyard. I have a crepe myrtle that is still blooming. It's beautiful. As I focus on these, the different tailwinds uh, also start coming to the surface. I grew up in a family where my parents loved me. My parents spent time with me. My parents taught me obedience, and they helped me understand truthfulness and the consequences of not being truthful. They helped me understand what a family looks like. They helped me understand how important it is to honor others. Uh, and, and how that helps others and that, how that helps all of us work together. I had this responsibility and that responsibility to help me learn the benefit of working hard. I went to this school and that school where I learned this and this from this instructor and this instructor who took an interest in teaching me concepts and truths. I got to go to this camp to work and meet these people. I got to make friends over here in the church. I've gotten to go so many places in the world, and I've gotten to see uh, what the, this bigger view of humanity than Sabina, Ohio, and see how diverse the world is. And, and then for us as God's people, to know the knowledge of the truths that have set us free from so many things that grip the people of this world right now. The, the, the things of, uh, that, that, things that, that are powerful westerlies that are pushing us forward towards the kingdom of God. To understand that God's law is spiritual. That it's, it's spiritual. It's always been spiritual. Uh, but he's placed in us his spirit 
to, to soften our hearts, to make our hearts hearts of flesh instead of stone, to understand the spiritual nature of God's wonderful law. God's given that to us. He's given that to me. Great peace have they which love your law, and nothing shall offend them. I, I realized to the degree that I meditate and live on God's law is the degree that fewer and fewer things offend me in this life. Uh, and, that, and that is a huge tailwind. God's word to understand it, uh, to, to be given the heart to apply it, to not be blinded. As, as, as Mr. Uh, uh, Jones talked about in the sermonette, that the world is blinded and we, we're sad for them. We look, we're look eagerly and we're humble about how our eyes have been opened to understand that. We look eagerly to their eyes being opened. I am a recipient of the grace of God. I am a recipient of Christ's sacrifice so that God sees me as clean and white in his eyes. How do you put a price tag on that? How do, you, how do we say that there's a headwind in that? That is such a tremendous tailwind. I have understood what, what it means and why we have suffering on this earth. I've understood why, uh, why people live and why people die. I understand the truths of the resurrection. God has helped me. He's helped us understand the preciousness of life. The life is in the blood and that we are not to kill. Any of you see that recent news article in CBS News uh, this week? It was an uh, interesting headline. It said, Iceland has now almost completely eradicated Down syndrome. Anybody see that article? Fascinating. I thought, wow, uh, what, what have they done? And what they have done is they have better and better identification procedures, and they're getting more and more women early on in their pregnancies to go in and get the specific test to, de to determine whether the fetus, with very high probability, whether the fetus has the Down syndrome gene. And as a result, how do you decrease that number? How do you eradicate Down syndrome? You have abortions. So uh, nearly 100% of those, I think it was they said, 100% of those who saw that I I identity, uh, that, that marker, went ahead and had abortions. So they only had, I believe it was three, in the country of Iceland that were born with Down syndrome. Those were the, the individuals who did not go in to have the test and didn't know until the baby was born. And I just think, wow, wow, what, what kind of a world have we become that, that, we, that we cannot see the preciousness of life? I have been given the blessing of knowing people with Down syndrome. And, and, and see the, the incredible way in which they are created. Yes, it's a handicap, but to see the incredible way that they are, uh, they, uh, are and who they are, and I've seen individuals with those who have followed God's way and the impact on them and the impact on me in my life. That is a blessing. That is a huge tailwind that God has given us, that the world, I say the world, but many in the world are seeing as... As, as a horrible thing uh, to, to, for that to happen, and, and then, so as a result, we will do this. It's a massive tailwind. Think of the, the inter, interventions in answered prayer, all of these, these kinds of things. Turn to Psalm 34. It's our final scripture today. Psalm 34. But, uh, you know, I, I think of the last several months, and I think of several situations where God is uh, intervened on, on very, very stressful situations for me. And, and, and I think of one particular situation in which uh, I was very, very stressed out about and had prayed uh, for God to, to intervene and, and deliver me in that situation. And he did. And, uh, and, and as it happened and when it happened, I was, I was just amazed at... Uh, you know, the stress that I had felt, and yet I needed to go forward, and, and to see that it worked out the way that it did, I, this, is, this is truly God's hand in that. And you know what? The next day I forgot about it. I was, I was going on uh, throughout the day, and then sometime late in the day, it hit me that, that oh yeah, that, that happened yesterday. And that was incredible. But, but again, it's that, it's that habituation, that adaptation, and we just go forward. 
And I, I went back and got on my knees and thanked God again. Wow, God, you, you intervened so many times. I've been freed from being a slave to sin. God gives me the Sabbath every seventh day to remember this. Lisa and I get to interact with God's people every Sabbath. And as a minister, get to interact with God's people day in and day out. People infallible, uh, uh, infallible, fallible like me, human like me, people that sin, people that, that, uh, that have problems like me. People that encourage me, we, inst we instruct, we encourage, we inspire one another, we cry with one another, we share meals with one another, we laugh with one another, we yearn for the kingdom with one another. So many friends, so many friends in, in God's church from around the world, hundreds of brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters in the church who are married, brothers and sisters in the church who are widowed, brothers and sisters in the church who are not married and want to be married but are not, are single, brothers and sisters in the church who are physically handicapped, brothers and sisters in the church who have mental handicaps. But we are all in this together. A final thing that we can do to see the tailwinds in our lives is to go to the Psalms. Go to the Psalms. Go to the Psalms regularly. And I'll give you some Psalms, but we'll just read one. We'll read the one that I mentioned, Psalm 34, to conclude. But go to the Psalms. Go to Psalm 3. 4, 22. 22 is a fantastic psalm that lays the headwinds and then brings out the tailwinds. Uh, psalm 136, Psalm 138, Psalm 145, Psalm 147. Let's read Psalm 34. May the road rise up to meet you and may the wind always be at your back. That's not in Psalm 34. That is a a, uh, have you heard that phrase? May the, wind, uh, may the road rise up to meet you, and may the wind always be at your back. Yes, but, but how about we state it this way? May we appreciate it when the wind is at our backs, and when it's not, or when it seems like it's not. May we never approach life resentfully. May we never approach life in envy, with greed, or with so much habituation that we don't recognize the tailwinds our great and wonderful Father provides for us to boost us along toward his coming kingdom, to ride on the high hills in his wonderful kingdom. Psalm 34, verse 4. Psalm 34, verse 4. I sought the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. There is no want, there is no lack to those who fear him. The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Come, you children, listen to me. I'll teach you the fear of the Lord. Who's the man who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? If that's the case, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil, do good, seek peace, run after it, chase after it, pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry out and the eternal hears, and he delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite spirit. Here are the headwinds. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them, him out of them all. He guards all his bones, not one of them is broken. But evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous shall be held guilty or condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who trust in him shall be condemned.